Hello. Welcome to Strangers Hall. This house has been home to wealthy mayors and magnates of the city of Norwich for hundreds of years, and now it's a museum. I'm Elizabeth Buxton. I've never lived at Strangers Hall, but my portrait has hung in the Great Hall, the centre of this magnificent residence, for many years. Just a little bit about me before we journey through the building that I've kept my watchful eye over for many years. Well, I was born into the Kemp family at Gissing in 1563. I made a good marriage to John Buxton of Tibbenham, and my family were very pleased. As you can see, my fine dress befits a woman of my standing. It's a shimmering satin stretched across a French farthingale. Come close. Closer, look. You can see the quality of the embroidery of grapes, leaves and tendrils and my fashionable patterned slippers just peeking out from underneath my hem. <laughs> As I say, I'm a Norfolk lady, but behind me here is a London scene. You can just see the River Thames and Westminster Abbey in the far distance. But for now, Strangers Hall is my home and you are most welcome. The house has been home to merchants, mercers or cloth dealers, grocers and hosiers from the 14th through to the 17th century. The building's gone through many changes, with each new occupant making his mark on the property, adding a bit here and changing a bit there. Visitors now always want to know how the hall got its name. Well, it's most likely that a group of settlers from the Low Countries who were invited to Norwich to bolster the weaving industry used the hall either as a base or for accommodation. The incomers were known as strangers. Well, by 1579 there were about 6,000 strangers living and working in the city. And perhaps this is why the hall was called Strangers Hall. Come, come with me. Look. Can you see the quality and craftsmanship in the hall? Well, this was a demonstration of wealth and status of the owners at the time. William Barley built the Great Hall in around 1450. He was a rich cloth merchant. Around 80 years later, Nicholas Southerton added many features including the crown post roof and bay window. He was a rich grocer and mayor of the city. Look. There, can you see his merchant's mark and coat of arms on the panelled screen? Today the hall is set for a feast. It's the late 16th century and feasting is an important opportunity to impress your guests. Most people sat on benches or stools, only the most important were seated on chairs. Guests were presented with rich and varied foods served on pewter or silver tableware with cloths made of fine diapered linen. Less important people were seated on additional tables at either side. Now, just look on the table. Can you see what's missing? You see, forks were not yet in use. The host would provide spoons, the guests would bring their own knives, but they didn't have forks. Etiquette at the table was all important. You wouldn't find anyone here wiping their mouths on their sleeves. That's what your napkin was for. The fine oriel window let in light over the feasting table and the screens, passage and service rooms would have been added at the same time. Many of the residents left their mark on the building. For instance, the stairs, porch and oriel window are the additions of Nicholas Southerton, one-time mayor of Norwich. The house of a man of this status needed to be impressive, but also functional. Francis Cock installed the main stairs from the Great Hall in 1627 when he lived here. He was a grocer and a mayor of Norwich. He also remodelled the walnut room. Now look at the fine furniture in this room and the panelling on the walls, which were added for warmth. The furniture is mostly made from walnut. Some of the wood was imported from overseas to produce this fashionable furniture.
Francis Cock would have used this room as his small, private sitting room. There are two clocks in this room now. Until the development of pendulums, clocks were actually fairly poor timekeepers. Both of the clocks in this room have very decorative inlay using different veneered wood. Look, come close. Can you see the birds and the flowers? This unusual turkey work carpet is a rare survival of an important branch of the local textiles industry. This was the sort of thing local weavers made to rival expensive foreign imports. As you move from the Great Hall to the rooms surrounding it, you can see how the building has been added to over the years. This was once an outside wall. Don't be shy. That's it, come in. Now this is Lady Payne's bedchamber. She was the wife of Sir Joseph Payne, Mayor of Norwich in 1660. Now look at that bed. It's a fine bed with its bed hangings and linen that provided extra warmth and privacy. It's almost like a room within a room. The bed hangings are replica and hand-woven in Dornix. Norwich was once a major producer of Dornix fabric. Of course it was men who were more active in public life and whose lifestyles and achievements were recorded. But take a look around this room for a glimpse into the woman's world in the 17th century. We can be sure that items like these would have been used by a lady such as Emma Payne by referencing paintings and also inventories and wills of the time. In a contemporary inventory of Thomas Harrison, a local Worcester weaver, we find lists of possessions including a warming pan, looking glasses, a Bible and other books and Dornix cloths, all of which can be found in this room. Needlework was a highly regarded skill and young women and girls would spend hours getting to the required standard to produce beautiful embroidery and stump work. Stump work was very fashionable in the 17th century and was often used to mark a marriage. This mirror relates to the restoration and the cushion commemorates the marriage of King Charles II. Now look, look at the fireplace. Can you see the date? 1659, and there's initials. J-E-P, referring to the Payne family. There has recently been a programme of research and conservation on some of the fireplaces, and it's thought that this one has been moved from its original position. It has been decorated several times with a brightly painted colour scheme. Through a small passageway is the little bedchamber. Visitors today can find out how hard it would have been to make up a 17th century bed by having a go themselves. This one is a replica based on one from the workhouse at Castle Rising and has a truckle bed underneath for a servant. And both beds are strung with flax cords which get tightened. Then there's a rush mat on top and on top of that two mattresses. Richer homes would have had a mattress stuffed with feather or down. For poorer people, chaff or corn husks were used. The coverlet or bed cover provided warmth and decoration and were a relatively new addition to the bedroom. These ones here are bright coloured, dyed using plants, woed to get the blue colour and well to get yellow. Up another flight of stairs and we're in the great chamber.
It's likely Sir Joseph Payne would have used this room to conduct his business and to entertain his fellow aldermen. Sir Joseph was born and brought up in Norwich and became a leading city figure, taking on many official positions including sheriff in 1654 and later mayor in 1660. The room is warm, especially when the sun streams in through the windows. Oak panelling makes the room even cosier, as does the fire. Again, we see the initials of Joseph Payne and his wife Emma, and the dragon symbolising the Guild of St George, of which all leading citizens were members. Just to the left is a little cupboard, probably once a privy. The furniture in the room is original and you can see that unlike earlier pieces it is more elaborately carved and upholstery is starting to become fashionable. The popular local product at the time was turkey work, replicated here in this beautiful cushion based on an original in the museum collections. Pile carpets like this one were luxury items imported from the Middle East and placed on the table rather than the floor as they were so valuable. Wealthy people like Sir Joseph Payne displayed their riches with expensive luxuries such as Flemish glass and Delftware. This piece here displays tulips, which were fashionable and perhaps an indicator of the influence of the Dutch settlers in Norwich. Georgian dining room. In 1748, Strangers Hall became the official lodging for the Assize Court judge, and this room was redesigned as a dining room. Out went the older style windows, like those we have just seen in Joseph Payne's room above, to be replaced by these deep sash windows. The chandelier was added a little later, but dates from around 1765 and would have been a sign of status and wealth. An 18th century dinner usually consisted of two main courses, followed by dessert. Each course consisted of several dishes, all placed on the table together. Gambling at cards was a popular after-dinner pastime. Notice as well the gout stool. A sufferer would put his leg up here to ease the pain. These ladies' portraits show the fashions from the 1720s to the 1740s with their very narrow pinched waists. This is the Regency Music Room. Strangers Hall has a large and important collection of early musical instruments and this room shows just some of them. Unusual instruments were starting to become popular, including hybrids such as the harp lute guitar. Music was an important accomplishment for young ladies at the time. The harp in particular was said to enable a young lady not only to show off her musical talents, but her pretty hands, well-rounded arms and neat foot to her best advantage. The portraits here are by the celebrated artist John Opie. He was born a peasant in Cornwall, was self-taught and was hailed as a genius when he arrived in London in 1780. His paintings hang in both the Louvre and the National Portrait Gallery and the Tate, with his prints being sold in their thousands. 
He married Amelia Alderson, a writer in Blue Stocking, after whom Opie Street in Norwich is named. The stairs down from this room lead us back into the Great Hall. Across the tiled floor and the parlour is our next stop. The parlour is a good example of how more private family rooms were gradually built around Great Halls to offer a more personal space, signalling a gradual end to centuries of communal living. This room was added in the late 15th century and has been remodelled and panelled since. The parlour today is set for a christening party. It is spring 1696 and baby William Bosley has been born to John Bosley and his wife Abigail, who are now the owners of Strangers Hall. A look around shows you how the birth is to be celebrated with posset, a spiced infusion of milk and ale served to guests along with sweetmeats or wafers. There are ceramics made especially to celebrate his birth and a beautifully embroidered bearing cloth to carry him to his baptism. Sadly, William lived little longer than a few weeks. Abigail Bosley went on to have other children at Strangers Hall. Her daughter grew up here, married William Wicks and had children of her own. John Bosley was a dancing master. He would have taught young ladies and gentlemen a mixture of dancing, fencing, French and polite manners, all essential preparation for the assemblies and dances in which they hoped to meet their future spouse. Norwich at the time was a provincial capital with shops, inns, theatres and assembly rooms attracting a wealthy clientele. John Bosley was one of several dancing masters competing for the patronage. And for something a bit different now. Strangers Hall has one of the largest toy collections in the country. The toys on display date from Victorian times onward and is just a selection of the vast collection housed at Strangers Hall.
From this room, you get a lovely view of the courtyard below as you move along through the building towards the wing housing the Victorian rooms. This small room is set out as a morning room where a lady would sit and sew or write letters. The furniture in here dates mainly from the 1830s and is typical of the time. Papier mache, varnished in black and gilded. The Victorian dining room was the focal point for family entertaining and well to do Victorians dined on many different courses, each requiring different cutlery. How the table was decorated was almost as important as the food itself, with napkins folded in various shapes. Have a look at the portraits in this room. They present a rather dour view of the family members. The embroidered bell pull summoned servants. A middle class family owning a dining table like this needed at least a cook, housemaid and nursemaid. If you look carefully at this nursery, you can see how the Victorian concerns of health, cleanliness and godliness are represented. The metal cot was more hygienic, as it couldn't harbour vermin. The tall back chair made children sit up straight, and the Noah's Ark helped teach children biblical stories. In some households, these were the only type of toys children were allowed to play with on Sundays. The parlour was the heart of the home with the mistress running the house from here. Friends were entertained here and family gathered here. Writing letters, making albums and playing the piano were typical pastimes. Fancy work magazines provided instruction on making Berlin wool work flowers, wax fruit or models out of shells. Needlework was still an essential skill for a respectable Victorian wife. The emphasis was on comfort and coziness, though with all this furniture the room might look a little bit full to you. Wouldn't all these ornaments take ages to dust? Down some more stairs, back to the ground level of the building again, to the Southerton Room. Nicholas Southerton's merchant mark can be seen carved on the right-hand side of the fireplace beam. He was mayor in 1539 and a wealthy grocer. In Tudor times, this was a counting house or office. Today, it's laid out as a kitchen. The cooking equipment in the fireplace dates from the 1800s and the furniture is mainly 17th century. We're getting to the end of our tour of the building now and we're nearly back to the Great Hall. But here, at the end of your tour, you actually can see the beginnings of the building. The undercroft or vaulted cellar is the oldest part of the building and all that remains of the original 14th century house probably built for a merchant called Ralph de Middleton. Norwich houses often feature undercrofts used for secure storage. As they required expensive building materials, brick and stone, these were also a bit of a status symbol. The hall itself stood back from the street, fronted by a row of stalls or shops. A stout front door protected the residence and was shut and locked at night. A door. <laughs> Now that's an odd thing to find here. Well, a closer look around the building reveals all sorts of doors and door cases, many of them, just like this one, lead nowhere. <laughs> they are the legacy of Leonard Bolingbroke, who bought Strangers Hall in 1899, when it had lain almost derelict for many years. He, along with other concerned early conservationists, was determined to preserve examples of important early Norwich buildings at a time when others in the city favoured modernisation. He actually saved the house from demolition, moved in with his large family and began showing some of the rooms to the public. In 1922, he presented the house and its contents to the city of Norwich as a museum of domestic life. Since then, Strangers Hall has continued to expand its collections and museum displays have evolved and changed. Visitors are welcome to wander freely around the rooms and guides are on hand to tell them all about the history of the rooms and the people who lived here. There are special events and schools come here to study all areas of the curriculum. This is my order. I'm going to hang my clock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
As with all museums, the objects on display represent just a fraction of the overall collections, and a vast amount of work goes on behind the scenes to conserve the objects for future generations. The labyrinth of rooms not open to the public are put to good use for storage. And it's not just visitors who come here. Many of the collections provide the basis for academic research for those with specialist interests. And of course, one of the loveliest aspects of Strangers Hall is the beautiful garden. It's such a peaceful space, even though we're in the middle of the city. The garden is enclosed on all four sides by Strangers Hall, St Gregory's Church at the far end, Strangers Court, which is just off Pottergate, and finally the Madam Market Theatre. The two buildings are physically connected. This dates to the time when the Madam Market was the Roman Catholic chapel, and the priests who worshipped there used Strangers Hall as their presbytery. They acquired Strangers Hall in 1797, and for almost a century Strangers Hall was home to a succession of Catholic occupants, with the hall eventually going up for auction in 1896 and being sold for two and a half thousand pounds. The garden was once laid out as a bowling green, but other than that its arrangement can only be guessed at. Quite possibly there were other buildings, workshops and perhaps even a detached kitchen on this plot, all part of daily life of the building. The garden now is laid out at one end as a formal 17th century knock garden. The geometric patterns of these gardens were designed to be viewed from above and there is a wonderful view of the garden from the great chamber. Here, box has been planted along with lavender, rosemary and thyme and at the far end of the garden is a bed planted with herbs which would have been used in the 17th century not only for cooking but also for dyeing yarns and for medicinal purposes. Norwich was famous as a city of gardens and orchards in the 16th and 17th centuries and there was a strong connection with the cultivation of plants with the influx of settlers from the Low Countries. The first recorded florist feast took place in Norwich in 1631. There was great competition to have the latest plants and flowers in gardens. Tulips were especially prized, reaching its peak with tulip mania in the 1630s. Tulip mania gripped 17th century Europe and was a form of futures trading. There are reports of bulbs at the time being sold for the equivalent of hundreds of thousands of pounds. Oh, there's the bell. More visitors for me to welcome. Well, I do hope you've enjoyed finding out about Strangers Hall and the people who lived here over the centuries. I've seen many come and go over the years and could tell a good few more stories. But for now, I must bid you farewell.